Hello and welcome to Newswire. I'm Aiza Omar. We will be talking about Sudan in the first part of our show today. So let's start off with what happened a few months ago. It started as protests against rising fuel and food prices in December last year. It quickly evolved into a movement for the removal of longtime rural, uh, ruler, President Omar al-Bashir. Bashir, after four months of protests that reached their tipping point after a five-day peaceful protest outside the military headquarters in the president's residential palace where tens and thousands gathered, Sudan's military had stepped in finally and toppled Mr. Bashir on 11th April 2019. Now, of course, a little bit of Sudan's history, it has suffered economically largely uh, due to, as analysts and critics point out, mismanagement, corruption, unchecked spending on the security sector and decades old sanctions from the U.S. which have not made things any better even though they have been eased off. Sudan's economic woes worsened due to the succession of South of Sudan in 2011, which took with it two-thirds of the country's rich oil fields. Now, when Umar al-Bashir was removed and Vice President General Ibn Auf stepped in and eventually also stepped out a day later, protesters could still not be quelled. So where is Sudan headed and what can the people of Sudan expect in the near future? Let's talk to our guests. Joining us right now from Sudan is Mr. Patrick Oyet. And also we have Mr. Rashid Sid M, the Sudanese Communist Party member from London. Welcome to both of you uh, to uh, the show. I want to start with you, Mr. Patrick, to just give us a little bit of an overview of what the situation is like. You have been reporting on the field, and as I understand from our previous conversation, you were trying to make it to Sudan earlier, but couldn't get a visa. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I was trying to go to Sudan actually last last week on Monday. So the coup could have actually gotten me in Sudan, but uh, I was denied a visa. Actually, uh, the people in the embassy in South Sudan told me that they were instructed not to give uh, visas to journalists, so I could not travel. But uh, overall, the situation is still very tense. The demonstration is still going on, even though uh, there has been change of the military council. We see another leader coming in. They are protesters still. Uh, out, they are still saying they want a full return to civilian rule. However, there are also experts who are saying that now the leaders of the protesters should actually take some uh, uh, precautionary measures because uh, the military have actually tried to give in. They have uh, changed the, the, the leader of the military council. They have brought in a person who is uh, more uh, acceptable by, by, by many in the, in the Sudan. Uh, they have now said that uh, the opposition and also the protesters should actually uh, 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 give them a prime minister who is a civilian whom they are, they are ready to appoint to ensure that the prime minister appoints or, or, or forms a government. So when you look at that, the military have actually now tried to move the process forward. They have, uh, they have, they have conceded, uh, if you look at the, 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 the time they came uh, when this coup took place, the announcement they made, it was about, uh, you know, uh, suspension of the constitution, suspension of the parliament, uh, you know, declaration of a state of emergency. All this seems to be now cooling down. They, they, have, they have torn down and uh, they, are, they are conceding. So experts are saying that uh, the, the, the protesters uh, and, and the leaders of the protesters should now try to focus on uh, forming uh, this government that is supposed to be, if possible, right. a joint government, in as much as the protesters are saying they want pure, mili pure, what, pure civilian government. Okay. The problem is that when you demand for pure civilian government, then there's a possibility of creating a vacuum, which is also not good. If I want you to hold that leave... thought, Mr. I'm sorry, we will get to uh, what the problems are really, but let's try and understand, uh, Mr. Uh, Rashid, your point of view also, how do you see this? Some critics are openly saying that this is just a change of face. Uh, while Umar al-Bashir was removed, uh, General Off came in and then now, in, because he was a bit of a controversial figure, uh, another general is in his uh, place. So how do you see it? Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. And uh, the signs for that is Umar al-Bashir and his higher echelons and the guys who are really involved in all the destruction, kleptocracy, and uh, uh, corruption in Sudan, they are still at large. Even Omar al-Bashir and all his uh, stooges are still at large. So if this is uh, uh, actually siding with the people, mm -hmm. the first step is actually to, uh, to keep those people under house arrest or arrest until they are being uh, faced 
by uh, uh, the judiciary uh, system of Sudan mm -hmm. under a fair trials and uh, 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 confiscation of all the money in Basel and mm -hmm. Siphon. Uh, these militias, with all their uh, uh, vehicles, with all their weapons and their uh, personnel, are, are at large now. So what sort of uh, siding with the people is that? Right. I'm also joined by Mr. Abdinur, the, a political analyst who is joining us from Istanbul. Mr. Dahir, what's your take on this? Do you feel like maybe the military will follow through on its promises? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for having me here for the discussion. Uh, I think the military uh, will not... Uh, give power to the civilian leadership because if we look at the history of uh, of this country sudan for the last uh, since its independence in 1956 what we have seen is that there have been at least four military generals who have ruled the country and the last of what of al bashir uh, and i don't think for this period that uh, the military will actually provide and keep their promise and uh, it, it shows the culture of this country that whoever comes to power and whoever comes uh, to, to influence the power will always stay. And I don't think like uh, the, the revolution is, is stolen. That is what I think now. One of the things that we saw uh, as a result, the Arab Spring that was highlighted in these countries, whether they were across North Africa or beyond in the Middle East, was that we saw a lot of inexperience of the civilian population when it came to leading a country. Is this something that we can expect uh, show uh, up in this situation, Mr. Uh, Rashid? No, I don't think so. Actually, when people started talking all the time, Arab Spring, Arab Spring, as if this is the first time for the people in that area. Actually, we started this spring in 21st October 1964, when the same civilians toppled a military dictator and established a civil rule. Mm -hmm. the, same, the same thing happened in 85, in 6 April 85, when people used the same methodology and toppled uh, General Nimeri and established a civil but, uh, but uh, Umar al-Bashir himself came so in are, with a military crew in 89 and he stayed on for 30 years. Who is specialized in strategy, strategy and uh, tactics and, and warfare uh, through the, the country. We don't want that anymore. Right. No, I said Umar al-Bashir also stepped in in 89 from a military coup and he stayed on till 30 years. What kind of a democratic setup can we expect from people who have not had the chance to govern a country at all? The, the, the base of our problems, uh, military guys comes. But Omar al-Bashir was not just a military man. He's actually assigned by the uh, uh, Muslim uh, Islamic uh, movement and the Muslim brothers, and he's been actually uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, directed uh, from behind the, 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 the curtains by the Muslim brothers, Hassan al-Turabi and the others. Right. So he was not ruling, ruling by himself as a military man. Well, but he is, his history is very strongly connected to, and understood as a military man, not that, but what critics are now saying is that this is actually a power grab, a dispute between not just the army, but the NISS and also paramilitary leaders, and which is including, of course, the Rapid Support Force, which was just earlier today seen to be dispersing uh, protesters uh, by force. This, is, this, may, this may be right. Yes, because this is now uh, a very fluid situation and uh, uh, those who have been on the summit of, of the power for three decades would not um, uh, let go of it that easy. Mm -hmm. uh, some other, maybe, maybe some other uh, 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 people aspire to do that, but Sudan should be governed by a civil government. Sudan should return back to democracy, to peace and justice. This is what we are uh, working for, and we have been fighting for 30 years, uh, and we'll fight more until we gain uh, uh, what we are actually went out to achieve. Um, we have okay. been, uh, uh, I mean, brutalized. I right. said, for Mr. Patrick, 
L let me ask you, we were talking just, uh, you were just touching briefly on the problems that now the people of Sudan who are out on the streets, and these are tens and thousands of protesters, are facing in, in a time where it is critical to decide how power will be handed over, how this transitional uh, council will decide. Uh, could you expand on this for us, for what kind of problems uh, this, uh, uh, the people of Sudan are essentially facing? Yeah, the, the problem are actually like uh, you have tried to mention before, because uh, the military have made some concession. I know the people of Sudan have tested that whenever they protest, uh, their demands could be met. They have toppled of President Omar al-Bashir. Another military leader has gone. Another one has come in. But the one who has come in has, has given some concession. And I think it is worthy uh, of uh, consideration, because uh, what I am seeing as a problem is a vacuum being created. If now the military all say, OK, now civilian come over take over the power and we are going back to our barracks then so what there is a vacuum there is no government there is no president there is no you know, there's no order. So there's a possibility of chaos coming in. So what what what, uh, what many experts that I talk to have been saying is that it's now good for the people of the Sudan. Now that the army has said, give us a prime minister, you the civilian, give us a prime minister, then the prime minister will form a government. Then we are only going to run for a, a specific period of time, two years maximum. After that, you carry out election. And they have said, we do not want National Congress Party members now to participate in this uh, transitional or inter in government. I think this is a good concession. And if the people of Sudan take it, then they will not create that vacuum, which vacuum could easily create chaos. When that is done, then when they go for the election, they can even say we do not want any military person to, to contest. That can be put in the constitution, whereby you say any military person cannot contest to be a president. Maybe you can resign from your position as a military man and then you contest as a civilian. So therefore you have your civilian government. But if you push too hard and then the military go to the barracks, everybody goes away and then the protesters remain on the streets and you are going to create some kind of chaos. And you know the region, you know what has happened in Libya. Mm -hmm. some, we, we have some, uh, some groups, some militant uh, groups. We have also in the Sudan some, uh, some, some of the armed groups that have been fighting President Omar al-Bashir's government. They are still armed. They are in Darfur, right. they are in Kordofan, they are in Luba Mountain. They, so chaos can easily be created if the situation is not handled properly. It is a precarious situation. And Mr. Dharir, what do you think? Will this, any kind of settlement over time, will it be inclusive enough to satisfy the diverse interests of the protest movement and civilian opposition? First of all, what I think is that now uh, the situation is very precarious, as Patrick said. And uh, the, what now needs, the first steps to be taken is that there could be some kind of political class reconciliation you know people in the politics uh, uh, of sudan are not now on the same foot about what happened in the country if you look at even in the military the uh, there are rivalries between them because al-bashir was uh, a kind of a, he, he he was managing everything from the military to the armed forces to the uh, intelligence to the to the rapid support uh, and, and forces but now, since Bashir is out, now you have uh, different generalists who uh, no, do not know which one to run the country. So first of all, you need to, to reconcile these generalists. Uh, at the same time, we, we need to reconcile the political actors in the country, including you, in, in Sudan, you have communists, you have liberalists, you have uh, secularists, you have Islamists. Everybody is, 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 is looking things from their own perspective. So I think to avoid what Patrick said, the chaos is that we need political class reconciliation and at the same time, there should be some kind of constitutional reform. The country has been uh, uh, working on the 2005 constitution, but now the military said they will uh, reform the constitution. But the very important issue that needs to be uh, fixed now is the economy, which has been the, the, the major factor of the problem. So all these things, uh, uh, all the challenges that are ahead of, of the new, new new council, but I think there should be some kind of concessions uh, um, among the political actors, whether they are in the opposition, whether they are in the military, to come together and form a civilian leadership. I think two, two years of military leadership is too far. There will not be any guarantee that military will deliver their promise in, in Sudan, because in the, in, the, in the neighboring region, Sudan is, is an Afro- 
as Afro Asian country or Afro Arab country, in the Arabian Peninsula you have dictatories in its south surroundings, Egypt, Libya, uh, Jad, Eritrea, all of them they are in a, in a, in a mili in military dictatorship. So okay. there will not be any guarantee that they That's will That's a really good help. point. That's a really good race there. There is a whole uh, question mark hanging over who will be the credible guarantors that uh, a democracy will be achieved in this time period. And who will hold, hold them into context and accountable if it's not, Mr. Rashid? You know, I think this is a sort of uh, uh, straight jacket uh, sort of thought uh, uh, is, is actually not helping at all. You cannot emulate the same experiences because people don't operate in vacuum. Sudan has got an institutional memory. We are one of the first independent countries in, Sudan, in, in the continent. 65, uh, 56, we enjoyed two years of democracy. Uh, military coup d'etat took uh, place in 85, uh, um, 58. We did the same revolution like what's happening now in 64. Then uh, in 69, uh, another coup d'etat. We took 16 years to topple it. Then in 85, uh, where the, the revolution happened. Then in 89, this military uh, coup d'etat which took 30 years until recently. Okay. Um, this experience, this experience will show us, uh, and uh, we, we, we actually been taught the hard work. Okay. Mr. Mr. Rick, let me quickly come to you and then I will go, move on to uh, Mr. Dahir for your closing remarks. We just have the last two minutes left. There is a, uh, a critics are also uh, highlighting that the army is using this, the Sudanese army is using this to uh, try and uh, push the story in the West that it, this was, the army had to step in to take over because of a, the protesters are essentially a Muslim Brotherhood as disguised and that they were trying to stop the Islamists from taking over. This is clearly not going to help in the future because they do play, Samus do play a big role in Sudan. Yeah, this, this is not going to help by, by, by if the, the military are trying to say that there were some, let me say, extremists who are, who, are, who are on the streets and they came in to try to control or to, to you know, to save the nation. This is not true. This is not true. Uh, the protesters genuinely came out because of the economic problems that were in the Sudan. They were very serious economic situation. Leave alone the issue of the, the fuel and the bread. This was just the last blow. The situation was so bad that the country did not have foreign currency. Uh, they, you would go to the bank, you have your money in the, in the account, you will not get your money. Yet right. when you go to the hospital, they will not treat you. So the situation was bad. The army cannot therefore say that they came to, to save the situation. It, it is the protesters. The protesters are, are actually the genuine the genuine uh, people who brought this, this revolution. Actually, uh, some analysts have said that the, the, the army are hijacking the, the revolution. So they cannot uh, really take all the credit. They only just uh, like type the last button for, for, for Omar, Omar, President Omar al-Bashir to go. But the, the, the major work was done by the protesters. In protesters, the exactly. Protest so it really brings into then when the coup leaders, will they uh, deliver? And uh, Mr. Dahir, uh, Dahir, it's just the last minute, so quickly, this is one last point I want to cover is that it will also uh, obviously reflect on uh, their credibility, whether they continue to protect the president, Umar al-Bashir, that is, or re are ready to hand him over according to the arrest warrants handed over by the ICC. Well, what I think is that al-Bashir will not be ever or handed over to, to the ICC because all these military generals are his uh, first or, or right hand uh, and generals who will not some of them even are part of the crimes that al-Bashir is accused of. So that means even ICC, if uh, they want to prosecute al-Bashir, they have to cooperate or collaborate with these generals who are also part of the problem. And I don't think they will hand over to them. And there, there's no simple, single calls from Sudanese uh, political actors to, to, to ex uh, to send him to, to hate. So I don't think that will happen. And, uh, but in the, in the short term, what I think to do is th to have a civilian transition in, in Sudan. There are non-political groups such as this Sudanese Professionalist Association, which has been uh, running the, 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 the protests. 
we can have a, a, somebody who's from that group, which is not an uh, opposition or which is not on, uh, a, a politician, to be handed over to power, like to be given to the president. To give uh, a prime minister for somebody, prime minister's ceremonial position in Sudan, they, it has no any, any prominence or any significance. So I think the most important issue now that the, the, the future of Sudan could be handled well is to have a clear and civilian-led government at least maximum for six months. But two right. years is, is too, too long. Too long a time, long. definitely. Uh, so thank you so much, Mr. Dahir and Mr. Rashid and also Mr. Patrick for giving your time to Newswire. With that, we've come to the end of this part and we will take a quick short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Aizoma and we are going through the second story of Newswire, which is a new Palestinian government, which was sworn in earlier this week. It's led by a veteran peace negotiator and a harsh critic of Gaza's Hamas rulers. President Mahmoud Abbas picked Mohammed Istai as prime minister, a move that deepens the internal Palestinian divide at a time when prospects for a peace deal with Israel are possibly at their lowest point especially considering that Netanyahu is back in power and that too on promises of more annexations, this time in the West Bank. We will be talking about the political divide within the Palestinians and how this is impeding progress or even the hope of getting peace or uh, uniting against uh, uh, Israel's plans under uh, and behind one front. So let me introduce our guests who are joining us today. We have with us uh, Yara Havari. Palestine Policy Fellow for Al Shabaka, the Palestine Policy Network. She's joining us from Ramallah. And we have with us also via Skype, Mr. Akram Al Satari. He's the head of International Relations Department at Sawaid Association for Relief and Development from Gaza. Welcome to both of you and thank you for taking out the time to speak with us here on Newswire. Let me start with you, Dr. Yara. If we can just get a snapshot of how things are unfolding now, this has obviously been in the works for a couple of months, but does it worry you considering what we have seen as the outcome of the Israeli elections? Yeah, so there was a new, uh, as you mentioned, a new Palestinian government was formed and this was uh, appointed by uh, the new prime minister, Mohammed Shteyer, who was appointed himself uh, by the president. Um, and it is indeed very worrying. Um, the, the, the government is formed of a, a largely Fatah-dominated uh, uh, crowd. Uh, and whilst they are new, many of them are new ministers, they're not necessarily new faces. So we're still seeing very much um, the old political elite um, in, in this new, new uh, government. Uh, and I think this really highlights uh, a very, very important issue within Palestinian politics, and that's uh, the lack of uh, democratic representation. Um, as I mentioned, this government was not uh, an elected government. It was formed by a presidential decree. Um, and even more worrying than that is the lack of uh, representation of the political factions within this government. It's incredibly Fatah dominated. Um, there is no presence of um, other factions such as the DFLP, the PFLP, Hamas. Um, and of course, all these other Palestinian political parties are part of, uh, are part of the reality of the Palestinian political lands uh, landscape. Uh, and I think their marginalization um, is, a, is a huge stumbling block in, in terms of uh, national unity, uh, political unity, and I think it's really going to affect how Palestinian, the Palestinian leadership is able to confront Israeli aggression, annexation, uh, and the overall structure of occupation. Right. Mr. Akram, what's your take? Clearly, this is something that has been uh, not just internal, but also perpetuated by whether you want to call it the West or Israel itself. How do you see this evolving now? Is it a worsening situation or do you think they might come out on top of this, especially with the threat that Israel poses with its new, new annexations plan? Well, as a matter of fact, the Israeli occupation has already decided to annex the West Bank. And if you remember, they passed a resolution like uh, eight or nine months ago. According to that resolution, they see in the West Bank as a sovereign part of the land of Israel, the grand land of Israel. 
the uh, the uh, Israeli Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu promised in his during his electoral campaign to be annexing in actual terms annexing the West Bank to the land of Israel, and I don't see anything preventing him from doing so. The Palestinians in Gaza are paying the the price of the uh, split and division that has been taking place and the rivalry between Hamas and Fatah, and I think that would feed into the already aggravating situation not only in uh, in Gaza but also in the West Bank where the settlers are taking over more land and Israel is trying desperately to legitimize its settlement activity uh, with the help and the support and conditional support of the Trump administration. Exactly. So how sidelining Hamas, not recognizing them, they did win the 2006 elections, didn't they? So what is it that they are hoping to achieve by ostracizing them? Well, uh, as you might have been observing in the politi Palestinian political arena, the Palestinian Authority committed itself to continuous negotiation with Israel. The Israeli uh, side has been uh, giving them a cold shoulder ever since 2000 till now. There were no meaningful political negotiations between Fatah and Israel. And I see in the division of 2006 as a fruit of the ongoing cooperation and security liaison between the Palestinian Authority and Israel. Israel has been luring the Palestinian Authority into continuing the security coordination without giving them any meaningful perspective for that co uh, for that uh, uh, security coordination. They have not been providing them with any political gain. They have been providing them with some uh, privileges for the elite Palestinian Authority officials, but nothing meaningful for the people on the ground. And Dr. Yara, you see it. Is this accusation that keep flying at they keep throwing at each other that Hamas? is uh, uh, Hamas uh, throws at uh, the Fatah leadership, that they accuse them with links with um, uh, the U.S. and Israel. This clearly then, when these kind of things happened, uh, proves to be correct. I think it's clearly a problem when both sides uh, are, are not willing uh, to come and, uh, and form a unity government and to form a unified leadership. Uh, and I think there are many people that are responsible for this. I think the fact that Many, most people in the, in the Palestinian Authority, the PA, are not willing to accept Hamas as a political reality um, is a huge problem. But also the international community are not willing to accept Hamas as a political reality. Um, Nicholas Maladnov, the UN um, special coordinator for the Middle East peace process, uh, welcomed the new government but didn't have much to say on the fact that that major political factions were not represented in this new government. So I think many people uh, play, are responsible and complicit um, in this political fragmentation. I think it's not helpful uh, for Palestinians. Um, I don't think it's helpful uh, in terms of the liberation project. Um, and I think there are many people to blame for this. Um, but I think they really now has to come a time, especially because Palestinians are facing a moment of historic vulnerability with these annexation plans, these sinister plans that Israel has for Gaza, uh, the U.S. deal of the century, which we're seeing unfolding before our eyes. Um, I really think now is a, is a monumental and historic time. Palestinian factions really must come together. Right, and this, the mention, as you mentioned, the the uh, deal of the century, as President Trump calls it. I mean, uh, Mahmoud Abbas has already come out and said we don't want anything to do with it. There's no point. It doesn't really help at this uh, juncture when uh, there isn't one representation uh, going to represent the Palestinians, uh, Mr. Akram. Well, the, as my colleague Dr. Yara said, the Palestinians are divided and it doesn't look like they are going to unite or reunite anytime soon. soon the Palestinians have not only even uh, have not been overburdened by that division, but they have also uh, been losing ground when it comes to political negotiations and that united or unified representation in front of the international community. I'm afraid in the meantime, the international community has nothing much to offer to the Palestinians. If you realize and track the decision that has been made by the Trump administration, you would realize that Trump himself decided something that is within the remit of the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump decided that the uh, Golan Heights are uh, sovereign Israeli territories. Trump is deciding to provide unlimited and unconditional aid, military aid to, to the Israel. Trump is also planning to recognize the West Bank as a, a sovereign part of the land of Israel, as they call it. Trump himself said, if I run for office in Israel, I would win by 
98%, 0.8 or 0.9. Mm-hmm. So the UN is not doing anything. The international community that was mentioned, uh, rightly mentioned by my colleague, Dr. Yara, is not also doing anything tangible to make sure they can stop that series of annexation of the land and continuous and systematic campaign to delegitimize the presence of the Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem after that siege has been suffocating the people of Gaza, unfortunately, by their fellow people in the PA in the West Bank. So nothing is going to change. And the only thing that can be viable in the meantime is to reunite and to start some reconsideration of the national project and to come to common ground between the CSO, civil society organizations, political factions, and other powers on the ground to change the reality that has been changing the future of Palestinians and undermining that future. See, that's a really good point, uh, Dr. Yara, let me bring you into this. You see, what I'm trying to highlight here is that as long as uh, the Palestinian Authority refuses to take, uh, uh, whether it is the uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad or it's the Hamas, the parties or the factions that are representing Gaza and continue to isolate them, there's absolutely a valid question out there that who is the Palestinian Authority then representing? You're absolutely correct. The Palestinian Authority, uh, we must always remember, was created uh, after Oslo as a mechanism to maintain the Palestinian populations in Area A of the West Bank. They are not the representation of the Palestinian people. They certainly do not represent Palestinians in Gaza. They do not represent the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And they do not represent the Palestinian refugees in exile. And I think we have to make a very clear distinction between the PLO and the PA and what actually is the function of the PA. And I think it's now, you know, a very important time for Palestinians to think about this distinction. But the Palestinian Authority doesn't have an interest um, in representing all Palestinians. They have made that very clear in in their maneuverings. Um, They have made that very clear in maintaining a one-party dominance of uh, the PA institutions. And I think that's a major problem. Um, And I think it's it's a problem that should not be taken lightly. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your time and insight into this. It really brings into question that who the Palestinian Authority is representing. I mean, it was the Palestinian Authority in May 2080 that cut uh, 20% of its staff salaries in Gaza. It did not help the besieged strips a situation where the economy is pretty much crumbled. It's it's an open air cell, as most leaders, uh, world leaders are calling it. So it really brings into question that the narrative that Hamas continues to say that they represent the interests of Israel and the West might hold a lot more weightage. Yes, I think that according to the developments unfolding on the ground and according to the shocking facts that we are living and seeing in the Gaza Strip, coming from the Gaza Strip, I can tell you that there are families that cannot support their children for even a breakfast or a lunch or a dinner. There are families that big now for their food. There are children who go to the school, children who go to the shop and tell them we want to sell some of the pots in their houses to try to make sure that they can get those, to get some money to support their families. The siege that has been imposed on the Gaza Strip, unfortunately, part of it by the Palestinian Authority due, due to the cuts that were uh, that were taking place, and also due to the restrictions in the movement of goods and the movements of commodities on, uh, into the Gaza Strip. So there are key questions. One of those most relevant and key questions is, are the Palestinian, is the Palestinian Authority truly representing the Palestinians? Are those measures that have been taken by the Palestinian Authority are been, have been taken for the sake of supporting and uplifting the Palestinians and changing their, changing their life to the better? Have President, has President Mahmoud Abbas been, a, 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 been a, a, treating the Palestinians according to the established principles? The PLO as a Palestinian Liberation Organization was established. Is the Palestinian Liberation Organization itself now bigger than the Palestinian Authority or the Palestinian Authority is much bigger than the PLO after the presence of the PLO in Jordan, Syria, Lebanon was eliminated and now they have a representation office in Ramallah under the PA receiving their their uh, annual budget from the PA. So the key questions and the suffering of the people tells us that there are key suspicions about the motives of the Palestinian Authority and makes larger segments of the Palestinian people think that the Palestinian Authority was established first and foremost to protect the interest of the Israeli occupation and to make settlements activity viable. 
At the time Oslo agreement was signed, there were around 250,000 settlers in the West Bank. Now we have more than 800,000 settlers who are enjoying the protection by the Palestinian Authority and right. no one dares. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Akram, for giving us your time and your opinion also. And here I'd like to welcome two more guests who are joining us. And with us we have Mr. Jafar Ramini, the Palestinian writer and activist. It's very good to have you on the show. You're joining us from Perth. And also we have with us uh, Mr. Anthony Lewistein, again, joining us after a while uh, from Jerusalem. You're a journalist. Let me start with you, Mr. Jafar. The internal conflict uh, that is Palestinian politics, and as uh, they come to loggerheads, especially what, when we're seeing the new government form, uh, being formed, it's, uh, in, in your opinion, do you feel like this is not uh, no longer an internal affair only and there are regional stakeholders involved in Palestinian reconciliation? Well, there is no, no reconciliation to speak of. Uh, Hamas and Fatah are as far apart as ever. Uh, and I wonder what Mr. Abbas is doing by uh, forming a new government when his authority has no authority. And these are his own words. He said last year in the Fatah conference in Ramallah that he presides over an authority without an authority. So if you have an authority without an authority, why are you forming a new government? And why is the new government cons uh, all Fatah members? The other factions in Palestine have boycotted this government because they can see no hope of the Israelis giving one inch to the Palestinians. Every single Israeli politician for the last 25 years mm -hmm. since the Oslo Accord has emphatically said, it will not happen on my watch, i.e. there is no two-state solution, especially Mr. Netanyahu. Right, and then last were... year, Sorry, go ahead. Then in last year, in July of last year, Mr. Netanyahu passed through the Knesset the nationality bill. In it, it says emphatically, this is a state for the Jews only. Only the Jews have the right of self-determination. Mm -hmm. What happened to the two million Palestinians who are citizens of Israel? And then where is the two-state solution when Mr. Netanyahu and all his colleagues are expanding settlements in the West Bank, which are deemed illegal under international law? During the, the election campaign last month, Mr. Netanyahu said he is going to annex all the illegal settlements and the outposts in, in the West Bank. So this, where is the room for the two-state solution? And this is where he, the Palestinian he, leadership is badly needed to step in. In fact, the poll recently conducted uh, by the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research where a staggering number, 72% Palestinians in West Bank and Gaza basically said that they want a new uh, presidential leader, that new elections should not just be held for uh, the legislation, but also uh, to get a new presidential uh, uh, representation. The people in Palestine, the poll actually was 72% in favor of elections of a new president and a new government. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not going to happen. Why is it not going to happen? Because Israel will not allow it to happen. It serves Israel's purpose that we are divided and the infighting continues. I mean, if, if, just, if I may just... Uh, uh, um, quote Khalil Gibran here when he said, pity the nation divided into fragments and each fragment deeming itself a nation. And that is exactly what is happening in Palestine. Hamas deems itself a nation, Fatah deems itself a nation, and the twain shall never meet. There has been many attempts in the last 10 years at reconciliations, and not, none of them bore any fruit. Yet, Fatah and Hamas keep blaming each other for this impasse. So My opinion of a certain age who kept his finger on the pulse for the last 50 odd years, the sooner Mr. Abbas dissolves the shameful PA, 
and hands the keys to Mr. Netanyahu the better, because at least that way he will put the burden of the occupation on the occupier. Not that's, a, that's a pretty strong statement. Pull in our guest, Mr. Anthony. What do you think of that? Uh, this uh, one of the solutions uh, that uh, uh, have been offered here. I mean, Israel is obviously uh, perpetuating this conflict within the uh, Palestinian Authority, within the Palestinian factions. But uh, could this be the only way out? Well, certainly I would agree, actually. And I've been arguing that for many years. And I'll tell you briefly why that despite what Netanyahu and many of his followers say, they need the Palestinian Authority. They actually don't want to directly control the day-to-day -day running of the Palestinian society. Of course, the occupation means that they control the freedom of movement of, of millions of Palestinians. I mean, the day-to-day -day workings, the water, the roads, all these things that make up a society and a community, Israel doesn't actually want to run that. And I would argue that they also don't want to run Gaza. They're happy to run it by remote control. And remote control means through the Palestinian Authority. Now, the recent new Palestinian government is, as your former guest says, a complete sham. That's the point. I might also add that the vast majority of people in that government are very, very old men. And the majority of Palestinians in the West Bank are very, very young people. So that's in itself a ridiculous situation. And there are very few women. But more significantly, it's also just a really sad state of affairs. I'm based here in East Jerusalem, which is occupied territory. And if you speak to the majority of Palestinian youth, men or women, they will say that no one really speaks for them in the government. They don't even presume the government will speak for them. It's just a given that they actually aren't represented. In the elections that just took place, millions and millions of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza cannot vote in an election, an Israeli election, that controls their lives. Mm -hmm. And while, yes, Palestinians within Israel can vote, it was the lowest turnout ever. And there's a good reason for that, because many Palestinians say, what am I bothering to vote for? Who am I voting for? And that's a really sad state of affairs. So without outside pressure, this situation will never change. Right. And Mr. Jaffa, doesn't it work? say hypothetically something like this did unfold, though in a way I understand that you believe this is pretty much uh, the arrangement with Israel and PA. Uh, the Palestinians within Israel have no rights. They're not treated as first class citizens. What would happen to those in Gaza in West Bank if Netanyahu was handed the keys to the region? Uh, Gaza has been living under siege for the last 10 years. The West Bank is not faring any better. The Israeli occupation forces and mostly young conscripts walk in and out at will. They humiliate the people. The checkpoints are a hindrance to their lives. As the young gentleman from Jerusalem just said, there is no life in Palestine at all other than for the Jews. And for him saying there's got to be some outside pressure, I agree. But there is one question here. Who is going to apply this pressure? Is it the United States of America? Is it Britain? Is it France? Or is it Canada? Is it Australia where I am now? They are all in the Israeli camp. Mr. Trump, every time he opens his mouth, he promises Netanyahu more concessions. First, Jerusalem as the undivided eternal capital of the Jews, then the Golan Heights, and now there are murmurs about him allowing Netanyahu to annex the West Bank. But and Mr. Jaffa, remember, there's got to be a way out, got to be some time frame that in the near future where maybe even uh, the Muslim country leadership could get together at some point where they could put their proxy wars aside. I mean, this plight is really, really sad of how you're explaining the future of Palestinians. There's basically no future. It is, it, is, it is more than sad. It is shameful. The Palestinian, the, 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 the Muslim Ummah and the Arab countries have lost their moral compass. They are all interested in their own power base. They don't care about Palestine. They don't care about Jerusalem. We, are be, we have been abandoned for the last 50 years at the mercy of a brutal, crushing occupation. Many an Israeli historian and writers, especially Gideon Levy, writes in Haaretz every day about the apartheid system 
in Israel. Yep. And if you say this, something like that, if you dare to criticize Israel, they call you anti-Semitic yep. and they hound you. Yes. I, if I may just relate to you one incident that happened this weekend here in Perth, where I'm staying, we are in the throes of the new general election and two MPs, one sitting and one would be MP, dis described openly what they witnessed in Palestine at the checkpoints and the treatment of the occupation forces to the Palestinians. They were both hounded out of office. All the weekend, the newspapers here are attacking Miss Melissa Park and Mr. Josh Wilson. And that is the power of the Israeli lobby. They Absolutely. are like an octopus. Anti-Semitism is a rallying cry for anybody who speaks uh, against the Israeli cause here. And Mr. Anthony, let me pull you in. While there is a rather uh, morbid future uh, that Mr. Jaffer has predicted for the Palestinians, but if can we find any hope uh, in maybe Netanyahu coming back to power? And I know it's a bit uh, uh, ridiculous uh, hypothesis, uh, hypo uh, imagining this, but you know, when the former Israeli defense minister Lieberman basically criticized Prime Minister Netanyahu for allowing Qatar to come into Gaza uh, last year, I mean, maybe that could be something that we can uh, hold our hopes up to, that after the elections are over, he's got what he wanted that maybe we can see a more central sort of approach to this, centrist approach to this? I think the only hope at the moment really I see, and I've been writing about this for a long time, in fact, is not coming from within Israel or arguably even Palestine, although of course there are growing numbers of Palestinians in Palestine who oppose what's going on and they speak very forcefully. The Gaza March of Return, the people have been protesting every week at the Gaza um, fence. So that is certainly cause for hope. Where I do see some hope, in fact, is what's happening in parts of the US. The Democratic Party actually is going through an internal civil war of sorts about this issue. To be sure, the leadership is very, very pro-Israel. That's true. But within the Democratic Party and many young Jews, I'm speak as a, as a secular Jew myself, mm -hmm. there is a growing sense that the status quo cannot continue. Now, what does that mean practically? Does that mean that the Democratic candidate in 2020 will be better on this issue? Let's wait and see. I don't believe that even if, say, a Bernie Sanders type person wins next year in the US, things change radically. They don't. My point being that without that kind of pressure from, say, the US, things will not change. And I think that there is a generational shift going on. Trump is very powerful. He runs the US. That's a given. But I do think that there is a growing sense in the Jewish community in America that the leadership that has spent decades backing blind occupation of the West Bank and Gaza cannot continue. Now, how that plays out, I don't know. But I do think that there are a lot of young Jews in the US and then within the Democratic Party who say, not in my name. And I think that will change things in the coming years. Mm -hmm. They have to. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Anthony, for your valuable input there. And Mr. Jaffer for taking the time out and speaking to us here on Newswire. With that, we've come to the end of our show. We will meet you uh, tomorrow. And with that, goodbye.